Nothing about the animal kingdom is how you thought it was. Not only do hummingbirds have teeth, which they use to fight, but they also eat mosquitoes. Yes, your little nectar-drinking friends that have such a fast metabolism that they have to eat every 30 minutes or they will expire also eat mosquitoes and beetles. Incidentally, that probably means that using pesticides to get rid of insects is probably hurting the hummingbirds. Mosquitoes also pollinate flowers. Yes, hummingbirds eat mosquitoes, mosquitoes pollinate flowers. I think most people know by now that butterflies will eat carrion. I know I was shocked the first time I saw a bunch of butterflies swarming a carcass. Like most critters, they're opportunistic. Some do specialize on drinking the tears of other critters. Tears and snot, that is. They'll take a meal where they can get it. Some even drink blood specifically. Apparently, slugs and snails are a big enough part of a deer's diet that they have a specific brain worm that they get from eating snails. We've all also seen those videos of horses chomping down on a baby chicken or a mouse. Most of these interactions are opportunistic. We will see things like giant pandas eating bones or carrion. Also, we've seen them hunting peafowl and eating carcasses plenty. I will provide a prediction, and I will stand by this. If I am wrong, I will say so. I think we'll find in the next few years that pandas actually eat a larger proportion of their diet in meat than we thought, and they've done so poorly in captivity because we're not feeding them what they need. Why else would a panda go after a peafowl in its enclosure after just eating bamboo? We see a lot of these interactions. Things that are herbivorous aren't really obligate herbivores, not often. A lot of the time in science, we are just observing things as they occur in a laboratory. Or a zoo, or what we might have seen just looking out of some binoculars, as is often done in science. As a result, we have a lot of conceptions about creatures that aren't really accurate. There's been a big push in science for having animals in a laboratory environment that's more close to their natural habitat. After all, a mouse isn't really designed to live in a bear cage. If you're not in the biological sciences, you may not know that there's a bit of a fight between ecologists and microbiologists and molecular biologists and biochemists. I could actually keep running down that list of everyone who's fighting with ecologists. Ecologists think that animals are best studied in their natural environment, and everyone else just wants to isolate every single variable so you're only looking at one. I think there is some truth to both sides. Maybe we don't have to take it to such extremes. Granted, I am a molecular biologist who works in soil, so I'm at the intersection of bugging microbiologists, ecologists, and molecular biologists all in one go. I also think that this problem has extended into the medical field, and it's been a big problem. I talk about it a lot. A lot of medications are only tested on male mice. Highly inbred male mice at that. So we miss a lot of context on what kinds of side effects real people, particularly women, can actually have because of the way drugs were developed. So when you see an interaction or see something that is stated as butterflies feed on nectar, ask questions. Maybe you'll make a discovery.